The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. The first half hour presented by the makers of Reynolds Aluminum, the Reynolds Metals Company, and starring the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. For the next hour and 30 minutes, you will be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. Such bright stars as... Fred Allen. Wally Cox. Dolores Gray. Portland Hoffa. Paul McGrath. Lowe H. Mercury. Ginger Rogers. George Sanders. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> Excuse me, darlings. Before we get into the show this week, I just want to take a moment for some personal messages. First, to the callow youth who stopped me at the stage door after last Sunday's show and asked for my autograph, you walked off with my solid gold pencil. <laughs> the least you could have done was wait till I'd signed my name. <laughs> now, I want you to return that pencil. You know who I mean, the suave, debonair, sophisticated youth wearing knickers and cracking Indian nuts. I'm offering a reward If you return the pencil I'll return the shells you left in my hand And to the little girl Who got my autograph last Sunday I'm saving that bubble gum You left with me, darling And if I don't hear from you in five days I'm combing it out of my hair <laughs> And to the darling little old lady Who tore those buttons off me You can keep the buttons, darling little old lady But please return the dress <laughs> And oh yes, yes, the two boys and two girls who stopped me as I was about to get into my car. But wherever you are, darlings, the chauffeur's name is Sylvester. <laughs> Be nice to him, won't you? <laughs> autograph hounds, they stop at nothing. But don't get me wrong, I'm not entirely against autographs. There's one celebrity whose autograph I run after every week. It's the autograph on the check of our darling sponsor, the Reynolds Metals Company. And what a wonderful autograph. Pay to the order of Tuluminum Bankhead. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it's going to be an aluminum Christmas for me. Yes, Miss Bankhead, in many American homes this year, it's going to be an aluminum Christmas. And not just in the kitchen with the original and genuine Reynolds wrap, the pure aluminum foil in which many of you will roast your holiday turkey. Practically every household appliance that Papa gives Mama will be more efficient and longer lasting because of aluminum. Reynolds Aluminum. That new refrigerator will have an aluminum freezer compartment, crispers, shelves, ice trays. The new washing machine may well have a rust-proof aluminum tub. All along the way as you shop, be guided by the gleam of the modern metal in cooking utensils, furniture, luggage, lamps. And to dress up your gifts in bright beauty, look for Ray Glow Gift Wrap. You'll hear more about it later. It's something new from Reynolds, one of America's great producers of aluminum. Well, darlings, every week I'm surprised at the amount of letters the big show receives. I'm surprised at what some of the letters like on the show. I'm surprised at what some of them don't like. And I'm surprised that some of the letters are permitted to go through the mails. <laughs> oh, they're from friends, of course. <laughs> friends are your severest critics, you know. No critic is my friend. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, friend Alan. <laughs> Tallulah, if you start paying attention to what your friends tell you about your show, you'll wind up like me, without a program. <laughs> or even worse, on television. <laughs> That's been my experience with friends. Oh, well, Fred, maybe they weren't real friends. Oh, they were my best friends. They did everything a friend does. They borrowed money. They talked about me behind my back. <laughs> they listened to Stop the Music on radios that I bought them yet. <laughs> well, maybe they were trying to win enough money to pay you back. But, Fred, were they real friends? I mean, friends in need. Oh, they were friends in need, but who needs them? 
<laughs> you know, a man's best friend is his dog, and even dogs put the bite on me. <laughs> Old dogs with no teeth gum me when given the opportunity. <laughs> Tallulah, if you want an honest opinion about your show, go to strangers. Go out and ask typical average people. Knock on people's doors. Oh, you mean take a poll? That's right, take a poll. Now, let's begin right here. Now, this looks like a typical average American home. There's a picture of Hopalong Cassidy in the window. Here's the name on the mailbox, Ginger Rogers. Well, knock on the door, Fred. Let's see if he's in. Yes? Uh, how do you do? My name is Fred Allen. What are you selling? This is Tallulah Bankhead. I don't want any of that. <laughs> We're selling hatchets. Where would you like one? Now... <laughs> Please, Tallulah, do not antagonize our sample. Uh, Miss Rogers, we're conducting a poll of the average everyday American Oh, I'm so sorry Please forgive the way I look Well, you look lovely, Miss Rogers In this old solid gold lamé house dress <laughs> I was in the middle of doing my housework You doing housework? I was buying some more houses Oh I thought you were cleaning your house Oh, no When my house gets dirty I just throw it away and buy another house Oh, I see well, that's cheaper than hiring a maid these days to clean a house. <laughs> Miss Rogers, what is your opinion of the big show? I never watch it. No, no, this is not television. This is radio. I don't have a radio either. Well, what do you do for entertainment? Oh, uh, Ginger, come on in and close the door, dear. It's cold. Oh, I'll be right in, Paul. I see what she does for entertainment. <laughs> Well, we didn't learn anything there, did we? Didn't learn anything? Tallulah, how can you say that? It says so right here. Oh, no. Look, Tallulah, a poll taker has to analyze the interview. Now, a lot of figures go into the making of a poll. Now, you take Ginger Rogers. There's an interesting figure. Now, you divide Ginger by two, and what do you have? Fred Astaire. <laughs> right. Now, you take the name Fred Astaire and divide that in half. What do you get? Fred. That's right. That's me, and I like your program. <laughs> oh, that's one vote for me. <laughs> well, not so fast. Employees of the company and their relatives are not eligible to vote. And since I am an employee, relatively speaking, my vote counts for nothing. So, so far, we have discovered that your show is nothing. <laughs> However, <laughs> bloody but unbowed, we, we try this next door. The name here says Lawrence Melchior. We knock. Yes, what is it, please? I'm very busy. Is your mother home, Sonny? <laughs> I am Laurich Melchior, Senior. Oh, Senior Melchior. You're Spanish. I am Danish. Oh. You can never dunk him in a cup of coffee. <laughs> Mr. Melchior, what do you think of the Tallulah Bankhead show? What did you vote for Stuart, my Miss Bursmont? They're rotten. And they tell in the optimal, they're also rotten. And then come the Tulu, who's also rotten. Well, I don't know what he said, but I did hear one word <laughs> Yes, there's certainly something rotten in Denmark <laughs> Well, now we knock at the next door Where we find a rather peculiar name on the mailbox Portland Hoffer Half woman, half city <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> Any Portland is a storm, I always say <laughs> That's what you always say, and that is why we are out asking people whether they like your program. <laughs> well, let's knock here, shall we? Yes? How do you do? My name is Alan. Oh, hello, Mr. Allen. Uh, this lady and I are on a radio program together. Hello, Gracie. <laughs> hello, Rochester. <laughs> No, no, you don't understand, Miss Hoffer. She's a colleague of mine on the big show. Oh, working your way through colleague. <laughs> <laughs> well, ob uh, Tallulah, obviously this is one of your listeners. <laughs> but Miss Hoffer, you better not let your husband hear you tell a joke like that. Where do you think I got it? <laughs> Well, you can't count her vote anyway, Tallulah. No, no, no. She's employed as a wife of one of the employees. Well, let's try this shrunken little abode here. <laughs> the name on the door says Wally Cox. Hello. Well, how do you do? May we speak to the lady of the house? 
I'm the lady of the house. So you're a bachelor? No, I'm married. But where's your wife? She went to work. What kind of a crazy question is that? What we want to know is, do you like Tallulah Bankhead? Tallulah Bankhead? Yeah, I might. What do you mean you might? What is this, a testimonial or something? I want to get paid if this is a testimonial. How much? Well, a dollar, I guess. Give him a dollar, Fred. All right, here you are. Thank you. Now, how about the testimonial? Okay. I've been smoking to all the bankhead for years. <laughs> there is no unpleasant aftertaste. <laughs> Well, there's another dollar gone up in smoke. Now about this next place, Tallulah, here's the name, uh, Dolores Gray. Oh, yes, she's the star of that Broadway hit, Two on the Isle. Yes, what can I... Oh, what a terrible accident that must have been. Just bring her in and lay her down here on the couch. <laughs> oh, dear, she must have been a beautiful woman. Darling... You're going to have such an accident in about two minutes that they're going to change the name of your show to One on the Isle. Now, la ladies, please, ladies, Tallulah, calm yourself. You stay out of well, there. No, you stop shouting at that nice old man. That nice old man only came here to ask you if you listen to the big show. Well, I happen to listen to it every Sunday, and personally, I like it. And furthermore, I happen to think Tallulah Bankhead is the greatest actress in the theater. Now, what do you know? Well, I know enough not to answer any more of your questions. Well, we'll never ask you any more questions. What do you think of that? That suits me. Goodbye. Goodbye to you. Boy, she was really sore, wasn't she? Yes, I didn't mean to get her that mad, Fred. Dolores, what are you doing out here in the street? Tallulah, come out of that house. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, Fred. Excuse me, Dolores. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, Tallulah. Ah, uh, she's sweet, isn't she, Fred? Yes. Nicely furnished place and so neat. But you should see the upstairs. <laughs> really? Well, this seems to be a karma home, Tallulah. It says George Sanders. Let's try him. How do you do, Mr. Sanders? What? Halloween again? <laughs> Sanders, protect yourself. If I can only find something to hit you with... Tallulah, put me down. <laughs> Mr. Sanders, we only want to ask you one question. Again? No. I will definitely not run for president. <laughs> well, did you learn anything from that poll, Tallulah? Well, I learned one thing, Fred. Since George Sanders isn't running for president, the field has been narrowed down to Taft, Eisenhower, MacArthur, Warren, Truman, Bricker, Vincent, Gray. Gray? How did that name get in there? Oh, yes, that's Dolores Gray who is not running for president, but is enjoying a long run in the hit musical, Two on the Isle. Dolores is a lovely, talented singer who set London on its ear when she starred in Annie Get Your Gun. Tonight, Dolores is going to sing her latest record, a song she recently made famous, Shrimp Boats. Meredith, darling, if you please. <laughs> Shrimp boats is a-coming, their sails are in sight. Shrimp boats is a-coming, there's dancing tonight. Shrimp boats is a-coming, there's dancing tonight. Why don't you hurry, hurry, hurry home? Why don't you hurry, hurry, hurry home? Look here, the shrimp boats is a coming, there's dancing tonight. Shrimp boats is a coming, there's dancing tonight. They go to sea with the evening tide, and their women folk wave their goodbye. Tonight, 
Look here, the shrimp boat is a-coming, there's dancing tonight. Shrimp boat is a-coming, there's dancing tonight. Happy the days while they're mending the nets, till once more they ride high out to sea. will be till that wonderful day when they see shrimp boats is a coming their sails are in sight shrimp boats is a coming they're dancing tonight look here the shrimp boats is a coming they're dancing tonight Laura's grave, and we want to hear from you again, darling, later in the show. But right now, here's a word from the Reynolds Metals Company on how to do your Christmas wrapping bright and early. Well, Miss Bankhead, early Christmas wrapping is always a good idea. But for bright Christmas wrapping, here's a wonderful new idea. It's the sensational new Ray Glow gift wrap. Gleaming with gold and silver and all the gay holiday colors in many different designs, you might almost think this Ray Glow gift wrap was aluminum. But it isn't. Reynolds puts on paper this amazing brilliance, this star-spangled beauty, through the use of aluminum pigment in the ink. Yes, tiny flakes of aluminum that sparkle as gold and silver and shimmer through the rich colors. You've never seen anything else like it. Be sure to get enough rolls of Ray Glow gift wrap when next you shop. Choose your designs while the selection is complete at grocery and drug stores, department and variety stores. Ray Glow is a product of the special printing art developed by Reynolds for aluminum foil packages. The packages that on every supermarket shelf proclaim the age of aluminum. Reynolds Aluminum. Theater fans have loved this season on Broadway because of the many offerings which have featured the top names of Hollywood. Perhaps the greatest thrill of all was the appearance of Ginger Rogers in the Lure Benoit comedy, Love and Let Love. And so tonight, on the big show, we bring you Ginger Rogers with Paul McGrath in Act Two, Scene One of Love and Let Love. As the curtain rises, Valerie King the highly successful actress and the toast of Broadway is entering the apartment of Charles Warren, her longtime friend and advisor. Valerie has just lost one of the men in her life, a boy who's run away with her less glamorous but more predictable sister. And so she's come to Charles for consolation. As Valerie enters and they move toward each other with extended hands, it is obvious that Charles' feelings are not confined merely as those of a good friend. Oh, Valerie, my dear, I'm so sorry to have kept you waiting. I should have telephoned you first. Forgive me for coming so unexpectedly. Unexpectedly or not, you're always welcome. But, darling, I know you well enough to see that something's wrong. What is it? Is it uh, Dick? Oh, I haven't seen Dick for three days since my sister Ruth disappeared. Well. She flew the coop and he spread his wings and took off after. Oh, are you very upset? Yes. No, I'm sort of wounded. Oh, I like that better. Wounds heal quickly. Perhaps. You'll see. Besides, since Ruth won this man over so completely... It's better the thing should have been settled promptly. Is that what you think? <laughs> you weren't really in love with Dick now, Valerie, were you? Mm, no. Besides, I haven't come to talk about him. What's on my mind is something entirely different. Different? 
Would you believe it? Since he's been gone, the one question I've been putting to myself is not why has Dick done this to me? No. The one thought that has obsessed me is why has Charles done this to me? I? Yes, Charles, you. Suddenly a thousand little things came back to my memory to enlighten me. Well, what sort of things, Valerie? Well, you often used to ask me to go out with you before. You came to pick me up after the theater, take me out to supper. I remember one night you asked me a lot of questions about my private life, why I lived alone. Well, yes, probably. Then I met Dick, and by degrees, oh, abruptness is foreign to your nature. You stopped asking me to go out alone with you. Oh, but we never, thank heaven, stopped seeing each other. When I invited you, yes, to dinner, to cocktail parties. Oh, whenever I came here, you always greeted me with your usual boundless amiability. But your whole attitude was certainly, how shall I say, different. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know what you mean, dear. <laughs> I've just been remembering things. Whatever I ask of you, Charles, you've always done it at once. It seems that you're permanently at my disposal, that to fulfill my every wish is your sole concern. Why? Well, because I'm your best friend, dear. And because you're you. Charming, witty, attractive. Always paying compliments. And I mean them. Frequently, you know, a compliment is a declaration which has lacked courage. Courage? Come, Charles, why not confess? You're in love with me. Uh, Valerie. Well, you prove it by everything you do. Am I not right? Well, I... <laughs> well, what, what can I answer, Valerie? I if my feelings for you really are what you believe them to be, and if I have never told you, why should I tell you today? Well, is it because you're 25 years older than I? 27. There we are. That's it, isn't it? The difference in our ages. Oh, why haven't you thought? You have such a brilliant mind. Why haven't you used it? I, I'm afraid you're confusing me, Valerie. What are you trying to say, dear? Well, I'm 29, soon 30, and I've never married, yet I've had many proposals. Well, I don't doubt that. I recall my various suitors. A most diversified collection. Well, a quite presentable one. This one was charming, the other very handsome, a third 20 times the millionaire, and his rival sparkling with wit. What stopped me every time, Charles? Do you know? <laughs> How could I? Only the awareness that to a man of my own age, I couldn't give enough of myself. I'm too busy. Young people are exacting. I'm certain that's why Dick turned to my sister. Well, yes, that's, uh, that's entirely possible. I know it is. The patience, understanding, and even the forbearance, which I cannot do without, are not to be found in a young man. You, Charles, have all of these qualities. And to a very high degree. <laughs> Valerie. I've never seen in anyone such self-effacement and generosity. You're the one I need. And above all, the only one I can make happy, I'm sure of it. Uh, Valerie, I... Charles, will you marry me? <laughs> Valerie, do you realize... Oh, I know this is most unusual. I mean, highly unconventional. A woman does not propose to a man. But then, I've always broken all the rules. And besides, if you refuse... I know it won't be because you don't care for me, but because you lack confidence in yourself. You're too conscious of your limitations. What? So, be it yes or no, your answer could only be complimentary to me. Valerie, dear, it, it's not my age alone. I, I'm far from handsome. Better so. Other women will be less jealous of me. Well, uh, there's also the matter of health. My heart isn't too strong, you know. You're too kind. You've used it too much. But my eyesight is failing. Your beauty deserves to be fully appreciated. But when my first wrinkles appear, you won't notice them either. <laughs> oh, think it over, darling. You love to roam the fields on Sundays to ride horses and swim and dance and go to bed at dawn. I, I couldn't keep up with you. But there's so many other things we could do together. I've never read enough. Never had the time. No <laughs> one to advise me. Other men have maybe discover landscapes. You could make me discover genius. How much better. Oh, Valerie, don't tempt me. It's too beautiful. You're... You're so young, such a miracle of vitality. Do you really object to that? I worship True, it. True, I love to do as many things as possible. Is that really intolerable? To appear in the same play in the same theater night after night is not enough for me. Pictures give me a chance to reach millions of people. And if I sometimes sing in nightclubs after 12, it's only because to stay out so late, surely those poor people are not happy at home. It's a good deed to give him a little fun. Why, of course it is. And I want a husband who can understand that and who, too, comprehends his function in this world as I do mine. You're right, Valerie. At last, you acknowledge Entirely. It. So, do you know what I've thought? No, what? 
Today is May 18th. I'm going to tell Borkoff on him and want him to close the play on the 31st. It's a Saturday. Close the play, but, but you're still playing the standing room. Oh, it'll only be for three months. We'll reopen September the 1st. Do you mind telling me why, darling? Because I want to take a long honeymoon with you, Charles. It's the first time in my life I'm going to take three months vacation. But it's the first time I've ever really wanted to. You're adorable. Three months, 13 weeks, 91 days. We'll get married the day after my last show. Oh, no, that's a Sunday. But the following day, Monday, June the 2nd, we'll leave the same night. Already, I can imagine our itinerary. Well, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> well, first, we'll fly to Miami, of course, with a dinner at Palm Beach on the terrace of the Breakers. Oh, it'll be stifling in June, but all the more enchanting because no one will be there. <laughs> then the next day, we'll fly to... Cuba! Havana, the key to the Western world. Oh, we can't afford to miss that. You insist upon seeing Jamaica? No, not particularly. Good. One of my uncles was eaten up by a crocodile on the beach. I'd prefer to bathe elsewhere. So, we skipped Jamaica in, in favor of what? South America. Now we're in Brazil. Oh, Charles, the Bay of Rio. Oh, they say it's gorgeous. <sighs> then Buenos Aires, of course. Incidentally, for two years, I've had bids from a nightclub down there. <laughs> they offer me $10,000 a week. I could do my act for a week. Oh, not both shows, because I wouldn't want to leave you all evening, but one show maybe. Well, anyway, we'll talk about that later. Then we'll fly to Santiago, Chile, Lima, Peru, two days in Mexico. Is that all two days? Oh, we can't possibly stay any longer. We have reservations in Honolulu. Oh, do we? Of course. We want to hear that wonderful Hawaiian orchestras. And the following week, Charles, where are we? <laughs> I don't know. I do. Tokyo. Oh, what a wonderful idea. <laughs> Japan, cherry blossoms. Yes. And the Ameri American military headquarters. You want to meet General Ridgway? Oh, no, but one of his staff officers has written the script of a play. Oh, it's an intriguing right. idea. I just want to talk uh -huh. about it. Well, more than ever, Tokyo is a must. And after that? Mm, we come home. By way of San Francisco? Or Los Angeles. 20th Century Fox is preparing a film on the life of Duza. I'd like to just discuss it with Daryl Zanuck. Uh -huh. Oh, it'll be sad to come home. But then the theater reopens September the 1st. Meanwhile, think of all the publicity we will have had. The minutest detail of our trip will have been publicized in all the papers. The public will flock in more than ever. At the box office, the line extends down to Broadway. And turns round the block. I'm back. You have a triumph. And at last, I understand why I worked so hard. It's for you, Charles, so that my husband can be proud of me. <laughs> now I have a reason for all of my efforts. Oh, you're a magnificent woman, Valerie. What a future you're making me see. Then you like my little trip? I adore it. Oh, this has been a wonderful surprise, you know. A wonderful day for me. We must celebrate. Will you have dinner with me tonight? Oh, uh, tonight? Oh, no, no, I can't. My radio writers are coming to see me, and uh, it'll be the last script that I do before we leave. Well, I have to work on it with them. Then there's uh, Bulkoff, and I'll have to tell him about closing the theater. That'll take a little time. Well, you know how emotional he is. And then I'll have to rush a few gown fittings, meet my publicity man. Uh, there'll have to be some interviews with the newspapers and, and photographers, of course. And my dog will have to go to the kennel and... Oh, and darling. Yes, Valerie. Isn't it wonderful from now on, all the time we're going to have to ourselves? <laughs> Thank you, Ginger Rogers. You were, as usual, divine. And thanks, too, to your clever leading man, Paul McGrath. Don't go away, you two, now. I want to chat with you right after we hear how Reynolds helps you stretch a dollar. An aluminum dollar, that is. <laughs> of course, Miss Bankhead, the U.S. Mint doesn't turn out aluminum dollars by any stretch of the imagination. But after 1940, when Reynolds brought competition into the aluminum industry the dollars spent for aluminum increased very markedly in value. Production went up, price came down. Aluminum is the only basic metal that costs less today than before World War II. And the future is still brighter, for the uses of Reynolds aluminum multiply amazingly. It is true that many of today's new uses are military. Aluminum PT boats, for example. Aluminum in the new walkie-talkies of the Signal Corps. But our competitive industry, made competitive by Reynolds, is expanding day by day to meet military demands first and then civilian needs. Reynolds, pioneers of progress through aluminum. <laughs> Ginger, 
I'm just dying to see your play. I hear the dresses you wear in the play are simply out of this world. You hear they are? You mean you didn't come to see me in the play? Oh, well, I just couldn't find time, darling. But I'm dying to see the dresses. Uh, if I came over to your apartment, would you model them for me? I'm just too nervous to sit through a whole play. Well, you don't have to sit through it. I closed the play last night. Oh, darling, you didn't have to do that just for me. <laughs> but tell us about the dresses you wear in the play, sweetie. I understand you change your dress with almost every scene. Well, what, what, what colors are the dresses? Well, they're cocktail dresses. One is uh, watermelon red, one is strawberry pink, and one is tangerine. Oh, fruit cocktail. <laughs> well, that sounds delicious. Uh, by the way, Ginger, I like your leading man very much. Paul? Oh, he's wonderful. Come here, Paul. You know Tallulah? Sure. How are you, Tallulah? A conquerable. <laughs> Tell me, Paul, how is it you're not in pictures? Well, I, I've been giving it some thought. Well, Paul, if you're going into pictures, it's very important for you to get a good Hollywood manager. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a good manager out there. She's a very capable woman. And then, of course, he ought to get himself a good press agent. Mm. Well, there's a young lady who handles my publicity. Then you ought to get in touch with a good author to write you a scenario. Well, I have a scenario, as a matter of fact, written by two brilliant girls. And a director is very important. Mm -hmm. I have a director in mind. She's uh, really very talented. Who's going to make this picture? The Warner sisters? <laughs> Tallulah, you have a guest on your show this week who's done very well in Hollywood, an Academy Award winner last year. Oh, uh, who do you mean, darling? She means me. <laughs> well... Finally, someone interesting on the show to talk to. Hello, Paul. Hello, I'm glad to see you, George. How are things? I'm on this show, man, need you ask? <laughs> George, aren't you speaking to Ginger Rogers? I've already spoken at some length to Miss Rogers, and she has spoken briefly to me. <laughs> what did you two have to say to each other? What I had to say to her is of no consequence. Well, what did she say? No. <laughs> Oh, Ginger, why won't you go out with him? Well, he invited me up to his house to sit in the dark and watch television. Well, I don't see anything wrong with that. He has no television set. <laughs> oh, now, Ginger, you're silly. That's the only way to watch television. <laughs> uh, George, uh, darling, remember last week we burlesque a dramatic segment of our show? We had such fun, didn't we? Yes, you did. <laughs> well... Let you and I give Ginger and Paul our version of love and let love. You get yourself in the mood while I take a moment out here to ring my chimes. This, darlings, is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. This is The Big Show, Act Two. And here are Tallulah Bankhead and George Sanders about to do their version of the play Ginger Rogers and Paul McGrath have just done. Hello, Charles. Valerie, what a vision of loveliness you are in strawberry pink. <laughs> oh, thank you, Charles. There was something I wanted to ask you. What was it now? Yes, what was it now? Oh, yes. Uh, will you marry me, Charles? <laughs> but Valerie, think of the difference in our ages. Oh, well, darling, you're only 50 years older than I am. <laughs> oh, no, Valerie, you've got that reversed. You're 50 years older than I am. <laughs> What difference does it make who's 50 years older than whom? I mean, in another 50 years, you'll be 90 and I'll be 140. It doesn't matter, darling. <laughs> I think I'll go and change my dress. Go right on talking, Charles. Will you marry me, darling? We can be married at the end of the week. I'll ask them to close my play Saturday. Close your play, but you're still playing to standing room. Yes, I keep asking them to put in seats. <laughs> Look, Charles. Valerie, what a vision of loveliness you are in Hangover Green. <laughs> oh, thank you, Charles. Will you marry me? But, Valerie, there's also a matter of my health. My heart isn't too strong. Oh, you're too kind. You've been giving, using it too much. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> my... <laughs> My eyes are failing. Oh, you've been using them too much. 
Anyway, I'm no fun. All I do is I sit around the house. Yeah, you've been using uh, the same excuse for years. <laughs> I think I'm going to go in and change my dress. But Valerie... <laughs> oh, there, it's changed. How do I look, Charles? Valerie, what a vision of loveliness you are in bloodshot red. <laughs> oh, thank you, Charles. Well, darling, I have a honeymoon all planned, you know. But first, I think it would be nice if we were married. <laughs> Where would you like to go on our honeymoon? How about Jamaica? Jamaica? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, while you think it over, Charles, I think I'll go in and change my dress. Hmm, I, 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 I don't think I like Jamaica. There, I've changed. How do I look, Charles? Mallory. Mallory, what a vision of loveliness you are in varicose purple. <laughs> oh, thank you, Charles. I think I'll change my dress. Valerie, what a vision of loveliness you are in garbage can dress. Oh, I think I'll change my dress. I think I'll change my mind about being in this play. Charles, Charles, what are you doing with that gun? Charles, you've killed me. Valerie, what a vision of loveliness you'll be in rigor mortis white. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. I enjoyed that. Now, let's have a little song. Are you ready, Ginger? Yes, but first I'll have to go and change my dress. <laughs> well, now you do that, darling, while I introduce you. Ladies and gentlemen, Ginger Rogers, star of Stage, Screen, and Vogue magazine. <laughs> well, now saying I've got a crush on you. There's, that's orange crush, I suppose. <laughs> uh, Meredith, darling, how about getting another straw and joining her? How glad a million laddies from millionaires to caddies would be to capture me. But you had such persistence, you wore down my resistance. I fell, and it was swell. You're my big and brave and handsome Romeo. How I won you, I shall never, never know. It's not that you're attractive, but oh, my heart grows active when you come into view. I've got a crush on you, sweetie pie, all the day and night time, hear me sigh, I never had the least notion that I could fall, so much emotion, could you cool, could you care? For a cunning cottage we could share The world will pardon my mush Cause I've got a crush, my baby, on you I've got a crush on you, sweetie pie all the day and night time, hear me sigh. I never had the least notion that I could fall. So much emotion. Could you coo? Could you care? For a cunning cottage we could share. The world will pardon my mush. I've got a crush, my baby, on a sweet, sweet baby. Got a crush, my baby, on you.
Well done, Ginger. Too well to suit me. It'll be a long time before you're on this show again. Could you make that same promise to me? Oh, George, why don't you stop it? Nothing you'll ever say or do will make me stop liking you. Pity. That studied attitude of yours is just a cover-up for something. What are you trying to hide behind that hard, cynical exterior? A hard, cynical interior. <laughs> oh, come on now, George. You don't frighten me. Strange. You frighten me. <laughs> now there, that's what I mean. Your manner toward me is so icy. If I'd only get through that barrier you've erected between you and the world, you're so cold. If we could only get inside of you. It's 30 degrees cooler inside. <laughs> I suppose there'll be a long wait for seats. George, I think you're... Uh, you only come on this show to plug the songs you're always writing. Now, I, I, I don't uh, understand you, George. You're a fine actor. You paint. You play the piano. You play the organ. You write songs. You sing songs. I understand you design lamps. <laughs> and you've just invented something other. Now, now, how do you do all these things? Superbly. <laughs> yes, and I see you also write your own notices. <laughs> but, darling... What's always been puzzling me is that a man who is so aloof can sit down and compose a love song. Where do you get these inspirations for these love songs? In my mirror every morning while I'm shaving. <laughs> a fan club of one. Uh, what song do you bring us this week, darling? A song I introduced on this program some weeks ago, and which has since been published and is now available at all music counters in exchange for some coin of the realm. You'll recognize it by a large photograph of myself on the front cover. And if you don't like the song, you can always frame the picture. <laughs> yes, I hadn't thought of that. And use it as a dartboard. Uh, what is the name of this epic love song? The song is called When You Make Love, and I sing it again now by popular demand. I haven't heard anybody ask for it. Popular demand, indeed. Well, I'm popular, and I demand that I sing it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. George Sanders now sings his own composition, When You Make Love. The management requests that you be as quiet during this song as we are sure you will be after Mr. Sanders is finished. <laughs> Meredith, if you please.
Thank you, George. I'm sure that song will soon become a big hit. As we are singing, your voice is like a violin. Plenty of gut. <laughs> uh, oh, Miss Bankhead. Yes, Meredith Wilson. <laughs> well, uh, what's on your, uh, shall we say, mind? Uh, well, sir, Miss Bankhead. Uh, you remember last week that I told you I was going to try to pattern myself after Mr. Sanders? Oh, not that revolting, no, shady little story again. <laughs> yes, sir, that's the one. Well, I went to a party the other night, and I decided to try it out, being like George Sanders, you know? How did you do that? Well, I just walked in and stood there in the center of the room looking tall. It's not only a nauseating story, it's a tall story. Well, after I stood there for about two hours, I noticed that nobody was paying any attention to me. <laughs> they were all in the dining room. So I went into dinner, and the first thing I did when I got to the table was to act like Mr. Sanders. You know, insult everybody. <laughs> well, I insulted everybody right and left. Well, uh, how did that work out? The girl on my right left. <laughs> and the fellow on my left hit me with a right. Well, then the party really got started, and, uh... uh Meredith, uh, how about, um, starting on one of your orchestra numbers and giving us that wonderful arrangement of Victor Young's Stringing Along? Meredith, if you please. <laughs> Thank you, Meredith. As usual, darling, that was divine. Say, Tallulah. Yes, Dolores. For the orchestra, you always say it's divine, but for the singers on the show, you never have one kind word. What have you got against singers? I? Why, nothing, darling. I'm a singer myself. Well, that's, <laughs> that's no reason to be bitter. For instance, you were nasty to George Sanders. Why take it out on him? I think George is a doll. Uh-huh. Well, now, Dolores, sweetie, if you're interested in George Sanders, you might as well forget it. You'll never get to first base with him. I'm not interested in... I'm not thinking of first base. I'm interested in getting him home. Well, it's no use, Dolores. When we were in Paris now, George was on the show, and I finally got him to, to take me out one afternoon. We went shopping. Oh, that's nice. Shopping for him. 
In one shop, I remember, he was buying a tie, and he couldn't make the clerk understand the kind of tie he wanted, so he put his fingers around my throat and squeezed very hard and said, you see, that's the shade purple I want. <laughs> and that same afternoon, he took me to the Louvre, and uh, we looked at the statues. But when we came to Venus de Milo, I said, don't you think I look like her, George? And he said, not quite. And started to break off both my arms. <laughs> It's a good thing you weren't standing in front of the Lady Godiva. <laughs> that Sanders sure plays hard to get, doesn't he? Yeah, he's also hard to take. I used to know a fellow like that. I tried everything. I remember one summer I thought I'd get him by buying one of those bikini bathing suits. You know, the, the three-piece suit? Three-piece? What's the third piece? Oh, that's the big piece. The label. <laughs> okay. I remember we went to the beach a lot that summer. He didn't pay the slightest attention to me. He just lay there on the beach all day long eating Swiss cheese in the sun. He had the cutest freckles on his tongue. I even remember one day I tried that drowning routine. He didn't make a move. All I got out of it was that a crab bit me on one of my toes. You really, darling, which one? I don't know. I can't tell one crab from another. I, uh, <coughs> I beg your pardon? Oh, come in, George. Uh, now, here's a crab you ought to be able to tell. <laughs> uh, this is George Sanders, darling. Oh, this is a great pleasure, Mr. Sanders. And I can understand that. <laughs> I've uh, been keeping an eye on you, Miss Gray, all through this mishmash. <laughs> Only one eye, Mr. Sanders. The other one has been on Miss Rogers. <laughs> How about me? Yeah, if I had another, my dear, it would be on you. <laughs> oh, thank you, darling. Oh, George, I have a wonderful idea. How about a duet? Meredith has a wonderful duet arrangement of Love is Here to Stay. What do you say, George? Uh, what about a duet? Certainly. Really? Yes. Now? Quite. Darling. Dolores? Me? Naturally. Dog. Meredith? <laughs>
Nothing. <laughs> but we've got something coming up, darling. Lorik Melchior. To say nothing of Wally Cox and, of course, the other stars of our cast. But first, I want to ring my silver anniversary chimes. Three chimes of silver. This is NBC. And the National B Broadcasting C. Company. This is The Big Show, Act Three. This portion brought to you by Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. By Dentine, the gum with breathtaking flavor. And Beeman's Pepsin, the gum that's great to chew and good for your digestion, too. And by Chesterfield. Sound off for Chesterfield. Get something new, something no other cigarette has. Chesterfield mildness, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. Tallulah Bankhead will be here in a moment, but first, a word about Anison. When we ask you to try Anison for the relief of pain due to a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, we are not asking you to try a new or unproved method. For there are many people listening in now who have been introduced to Anison tablets by their own dentist or physician. You who have received Anison this way know the effective, incredibly fast relief these tablets bring. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. People by the thousands are using modern Anison today instead of other ways. Doesn't their experience seem worth following? Try Anison the next time you suffer from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted with the results. Ask your druggist for Anison today. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. <laughs> Here again is Tallulah Bankhead. Thank you, Ed. And now, darlings, we've kept him and you waiting long enough. One of the great voices of all time, Mr. Lawrence Melchior. <laughs> Mr. Melchior's selection for the big show is Leon Cavallo's Matinata. Maestro Wilson, if you please. <laughs> Bianco vestita, calucho di schio dal fransol, di guia con le rose sua dita, carezza di fiore lo stuol. Ho mosso due primi volcano, in tono il criato che par, e tu Desti ed in vano mi sto più collenta al cor. Me giunge tu la veste bianca, ischio di illusio al tuo canto. Don 
Yeah, bravo. Magnificent voice, superb, and a few other superlatives I wish I could think of. Oh, thank you, Miss Bankett. Oh, now, darling, please call me Tallulah. Thank you, and you call me Tallulah. <laughs> oh, if I could only sing like you, darling. Oh, you sing? I would like to hear something. Sing something. Really? All right, now let me see. Oh, yes, uh... Um, I'll be seen <laughs> in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces all day through. Lloyd, where are you going? To the air raid shelter. <laughs> Wasn't that the siren? <laughs> now, just a minute, Lloyd. I want to get an honest criticism from a man who knows music. Now, everybody else on this show is against my singing. Now, now, don't you turn on me, too. All right, I won't. Sing another song. Another song? Okay. <laughs> you go to my head <laughs> and you linger like a haunting museum and I find you spinning round in my brain like a bubble in a glass of champagne. Uh, that's the trouble with those cowboy songs. They all sound alike. <laughs> well, I guess it's no use. I wish I could sing like you, but I guess everybody wishes they could sing like you. I suppose everybody wishes they were somebody else. When Lynn Murray wrote this current song hit, I Wish I Was, he must have been thinking of me. But personally, I wish I was a singer at the May. At the May. Wish I was a singer at the Met. At the Met. If I was a singer at the Met, I'd sing some notes you'd never get. I wish I was a singer at the Met. I hope Billy D tell us what you'd like to be. I hope Billy D tell the Lula what you'd like to be. All right, Lars Gray, what do you wish you was? I wish I was. A swing and cling and vine. I wish I was a swing and cling and vine. If I swing and cling and vine, I'd only cling to that boy of mine. I wish I was a swing and cling and vine. I hope Billy D. Tell the Lula what you'd like to be. George Sanders, what he was, you were. I wish I was. A teapot full of tea. Full of tea. I wish I was a teapot full of tea. Full of tea. If I was a teapot full of tea, Tallulah'd never bother me. I wish I was <laughs> a teapot full of tea. I hope it'll be tell Tallulah what you like to be. Ginger Rogers, what do you wish you were? I wish I was. A horse who couldn't talk. Couldn't talk. I wish I was a horse who couldn't talk. Couldn't talk. If I was a horse who couldn't talk and never say nay on a moonlight walk, I wish I was a horse who couldn't talk. I hope you'll be tell the Lula what you'd like to be. 
Now, it's Melchior. What do you wish you was? I wish I was a note about I see. I see. I would say was a note about I see. I see. If I said no the bow I see, the lula could get the tree. I wish I was a note about I see. I hope you will be the lula what you like to be. Methodist, uh, uh, what would you want? I wish I was a corny rondelay. Rondelay! I wish I was a corny rondelay. Rondelay! If I was a corny rondelay, I'd go back home to Iowa. I wish I was a corny rondelay. I hope it will be the Lula what you'd like to be. Wally Cox, what do you wish you were? I wish I was a cricket in the grass. In the grass. I wish I was a cricket in the grass. In the grass. If I was cricket in the grass, I'd at every last. I wish I was a cricket in the grass. I won't believe you. what you'd like to be. Horton, what do you wish you were? I wish I was a dumpling in a stew. In a stew. I wish I was a dumpling in a stew. In a stew. If I was a dumpling in a stew, I'd bob around in all that goo. I wish I was a dumpling in a stew. I hope in the east, what you'd like to be. Fred Allen, what he was, you was. I wish I was a rose on a florist shelf. Florist shelf. I wish I was a rose on a florist shelf. Florist shelf. If I's a rose on a florist shelf, I'd just sit around and smell myself. <laughs> I wish I was a rose on a florist shelf. <laughs> I hope it'll be that is what we like to be. I hope it'll be that is really what we like to be. I wish I was dead. <laughs> but right now, here's something of interest to you. For, breathless moments, For your breathless moments. Chew Denti, the gum with <gasps> breathtaking flavor. Dentine tastes so good. Dentine freshens your breath. Dentine helps keep your teeth sparkling clean and white. Dentine, the gum with <gasps> breathtaking flavor. Before you go out and always after eating, drinking, smoking, refresh your breath with dentine. You'll love dentine chewing gum, for dentine has a wonderful tingling, nippy flavor that lingers on and on. It's delicious. And remember, dentine helps keep your teeth white, too. Keep dentine handy. You'll enjoy refreshing your breath when you chew dentine. So for breathless moments, for your breathless moments, Chew dentine, the gum with <gasps> breathtaking flavor. Well, darlings, a newcomer to the big show is a young, quiet, very funny fellow who has been making enthusiastic fans for himself in the smarter nightclubs around New York. His first appearance on the Broadway stage last season won him the unanimous acclaim of the critics. Now listen carefully to the refreshing and always original Wally Cox. It's a nice little place you have here. <laughs> they generally ask me over to lend an educational note to a show. I'm sort of a sociologist, see. I portray various human characters, and then you laugh at them. And uh, that promotes human understanding. <laughs> when I was a youth, my most candid friend was a lad named Dufo. I shall speak to you of him in the manner of another childhood friend, Johnny Fazula, for your listening convenience. We used to have a friend Dufo. What a crazy guy. 
always makes us laugh. You know when you're a kid, you do anything for a dare? You hang over the edge of a roof on a board for a dare? Well, we've seen these guys say trying to get too far to hang over the edge of a roof on a board. And we seen a board, it was a little thin board. And we told him, wouldn't hold you, you know? So he's going to do it anyway. <laughs> what a crazy guy. <laughs> we used to play uh, roof tag. Everybody has to run over the roofs. And everybody has to run under the wire for um, a radio or something, I don't know. So anyway, everybody runs under the wire, but do fall. <laughs> Get him right here. Thank you. <laughs> what a crazy guy. You know, when a guy can't swim, you throw him in the water, he gets scared. Well, we seen this guy, he couldn't swim. We was throwing him in the water, and he's getting real scared. So I was telling Dufo, hey, pull him out, you know. He's drowning, he's turning blue, everything. So he keeps pushing him in again. What a crazy guy. <laughs> we used to play a uh, backyard race. Everybody has to run across the backyard and climb over the fence and run across the backyard and climb over the fence. And like that. <laughs> and whoever gets to the end voice wins. So this one backyard, every time we run across, the lady comes out and throws things at us. You know, water, pans, bottles, everything. And her husband gets real mad. He puts up a board with nails in it. So every time we climb over the fence, we have to jump over the nails. So one time he's all climbing over the fence. Everybody jumps over the nails, but do fall. <laughs> Sixteen stitches. <laughs> what a crazy guy. <laughs> we used to take different cars and drive it around. We didn't keep them or anything. You, you know, some guys sell them. We didn't sell them or anything. We used to park them in front of the police station where we used to shoot them. Well, we seen this car, it was a 39 package, and the keys is in it, so we was driving around. So I said, let's go over to Dufo's house. So we went over there and left it on the front and went inside. I said, hey, Dufo, there's my car right there. How do you like it? So he says, that ain't your car. <laughs> you know, it's real dumb. <laughs> so I told him, sure, here's the keys. I said, go ahead, take your girl for a ride. So he gets in it. He just gets around the corner and the cops pick him up. He's on two years probation. <laughs> but you know, that's the only thing he ever done wrong. <laughs> well, that concludes that social document. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was in great demand at social functions as a youth on account of my extensive butterfly collection. I was allowed to eat ice cream and hear all the speeches. I heard the following speech at a club dinner in a small town in Kansas. Judge for yourselves its influence on my present psychology. A young man came in to me at the bank a few days ago, and he said that he wished to negotiate for a loan. Well, I said, what is the nature of the business in which you wish to invest? That's a routine question. <laughs> well, he said, I want to open a nightclub. <laughs> I said, what did you say? <laughs> I found it hard to believe that a man would say such a thing <laughs> in a public place, <laughs> such as a bank. So I took him to one side. And I said, what did you say? <laughs> well, to make a long story short, he said, I want to open a nightclub. <laughs> he said it again. Well, I said, young man. I said, you're a young man. I said, how old are you? <laughs> well, he said, I'm 27 years of age. Why do you ask? Well, I said, have you ever been to any large cities? Well, he said he had been to Kansas City. Well, I said, Kansas City, Kansas, or Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> I always try to inject a note of humor. <laughs> it 
puts them at ease. <laughs> well, of course, he had left that. Well, then I said, I said, is that the largest city to which you have ever been? Well, he said, yes, he guessed it was. Well, I had him there. I said, young man, what would you say if I was to tell you that in New York City, women smoke on the street? Well, he was quite surprised to hear that. <laughs> As you may imagine. And I said, there's worse things than that goes on in New York City every day in the week. <laughs> twice on Sunday. <laughs> It all started in the nightclub. <laughs> I said, young man, take a hint from me. I said, you're a young man. I said, why don't you open up a gasoline station? I said, you won't make a fortune. But I said, it's a decent living. Well, that young man walked out of the bank, a changed young man, as you may imagine. I am always happy to be in the position of helping a young man down the right road. I uh, thank you. <laughs> Wally, oh, you're charming. And come back to us soon, won't you, darling? Now, here are a couple of friends it's always charming to have with us. Here come Bing Crosby and Bob Hope, and they're signing off for Chesterfield. When it's time for old Chris Kringle and for all the bells to jingle, here's the gift for smokers all. So it's your dealer's sound is call. Sound off. For Chesterfield. Sound off. For Chesterfield. Try a pack of Chesterfields and do it. Today! That was the Bing Crosby quartet you just heard, folks. Dancer, Prancer, Blitzen, and Crosby. And this is Bob Chesterfield Hope reminding you that Christmas is just around the corner, and so is your friendly Chesterfield dealer with a complete line of Christmas gifts, including bright Chesterfield Christmas card cartons. Now, that's the perfect gift for any smoker, isn't it? A carton or two of Chesterfields with that Chesterfield mildness plus no unpleasant aftertaste. So for your friends this Christmas, for your own smoking pleasure all year round, take a tip from Bing and me and... Sound off! Chesterfield! Sound off! Chesterfield. Try a pack of Chesterfields. Do it. Today. Tallulah. Yes, Ginger. I wanted you to be the first to know. I just signed a contract yesterday with 20th Century Fox to appear in a picture called We're Not Married. And one of your guests on the show this week has been signed to play my husband, Fred Allen. Well, this is good news. Well, Fred, congratulations. Well, thank you, Miss B. Movies have been better than ever long enough. So they sent for me. <laughs> Fred, I'd like to get an idea or some pointers about how to play your wife. Maybe Portland could give me some advice. Well, I don't see how, Ginge. We've only been, we've only been married 21 years. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's from the people who thought it wouldn't last. <laughs> Why is it everybody's always glad to see somebody else who's been married 21 years? <laughs> well, anyhow, Fred, I think it's a good idea for Ginger to have a talk with Portland. Portie, darling, come over here, will you please, sweetie? Yes, Tallulah? Uh, Portie, Ginger's going to play Fred's wife in a movie, and Ginger thought you might give us some pointers about being married to him. Oh, I see. Well, Ginger, we lead a rather normal life. We have dinner at 7 o'clock, and then we listen to the radio or read till about 10. Then we go to sleep, and then I get up at three in the morning and fix Fred a chicken liver omelet, and then you I... You fix him a chicken liver omelet at three in the morning? Well, doesn't everybody? <laughs> well, if you say so, Portland, I'll remember that. <clears throat> what else? I guess Fred must be pretty funny around the house. Huh? Oh, yes, and that's one thing you've got to remember. You've got to laugh at everything. When he writes the jokes, I laugh. When he reads them on the radio, I laugh. When he brings home his paycheck, I laugh. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Just a minute, laughing girl. <laughs> Instead of telling Ginger about the life and times of the Allens, why don't we invite her over to the house and let her see for herself? 
What are you laughing at? Well, I was laughing at what Fred said. He didn't say anything funny. Oh, I never take any chances with Fred. <laughs> he may have meant to be funny. If you were only a sponsor. Well, Ginger, come on, come on over to the house. Thank you, I'll be glad to. All right, here we are. Fred, there's somebody at the door. That must be Ginger. Well, where's the maid? Why doesn't she go to the door? Well, she's getting dinner. I'll go. No, you won't go. We hire a combination cook and maid, and when the doorbell rings, she is supposed to answer that door. Did you tell her Miss Rogers was coming? Oh, sure, she knows. She's quite excited about it. Well, why doesn't she go to the door? Maid, answer that door, will okay, you? Okay, I'll answer it. I'll answer it. Keep your shirt on, Mac. <laughs> And stop calling me Mac. Okay, I'm sorry. I used to work for Mary Margaret McBride. Well, she must have had a door on her place. Answer the door. Hello, I'm Ginger Rogers. Well, come on in. What are you waiting for, Pause. <laughs> Hello, Ginger. Come in, Ginger, just in time for dinner. This is our dinner guest? Yes, I told you she was coming. I thought you said Roy Rogers. <laughs> What am I gonna do with all those oats? If I know you, you will probably sow them. Uh, <laughs> how about a little drink before dinner, Ginger? Oh, thank you, Portland. I don't drink, but you two have one if you like. Oh, no, I, uh, I don't drink either. Well, I really don't care for one. Well, I don't mind drinking alone. <laughs> No, you don't. You are going to serve the dinner. What am I going to do with all that rye? Why don't we just sit around and talk, Fred? Portland has told me how funny you are around the house. Oh, well, I, I don't know. I... Oh, <laughs> sure. Come on, Fred. I had the maid dig up your old radio scripts. Have you got them? Yeah, I got them. Oh, I don't feel like reading those brilliant old things tonight, Portland. <laughs> you don't feel like it after I went to the trouble of digging up those old scripts. What am I going to do with all that corn? Send it to Mary Margaret McBurl. He's already used them. Well, I'm... Well, how about serving dinner now? Okay, that pot roast has been waiting out in the kitchen long enough. Where did you get that maid? Well, we kind of put up with her, Ginger, because she doesn't want a day off like other maids. She only takes an hour and a half off every Sunday, and we don't know where she goes or what she does. <laughs> Well, folks, I got bad news for you. The janitor was out in the kitchen fixing the sink, and when I walked out of the kitchen to answer the door, he ate up the whole roast. What? Get that janitor out here. Come in here, you. What do you mean by eating our dinner? Do you realize what you have done, janitor? We have a guest for dinner tonight, and look at us, we have no dinner. What have you got to say to that? Pity. <laughs> Well, darling, that's our show for this week. Next week, our cast will include Jean Carroll, Robert Cummings, Ed Gardner, Hildegard, Anne Southern, and others, and, of course, our very own Meredith Wilson and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus. Until then, may the good Lord bless and keep you by the near or far away. Ginger? May you find that long-awaited golden day Today, Lorette. May your troubles all be small ones and your fortune ten times tenfold. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again, Portland. May you walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree, Meredith. May there be a silver lining Back of every cloud you see Wally? Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows Never mind what might have been, Fred May the good Lord bless and keep you Till we meet again, Dolores May you long recall 
each rainbow Then you'll soon forget the rain George May the warm and tender memories Be the ones that will remain Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows Never mind what might have been May the good Lord bless and keep you until we meet again. everywhere. Good night, darlings. This portion of the big show has been brought to you by Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by Dentine, the gum with breathtaking flavor. And Beeman's Pepsin, the gum that's great to chew and good for your digestion, too. And by Chesterfield. Sound off for Chesterfield. Get something new, something no other cigarette has. Chesterfield mildness plus no unpleasant aftertaste. The first half hour of The Big Show is presented by the makers of Reynolds Aluminum, the Reynolds Metals Company. The Big Show is produced and directed by D. Engelbach and written by Goodman Ace, Selma Diamond, George Foster, Mort Green, and Joel Murcott. The chorus directed by Ray Charles. Special musical arrangements by Sidney Fine, Phil Moore, and Tutti Camerata. This is Ed Hurley He saying good night. <laughs> Enjoy American music with Phil Harris and Alice Faye, next on NBC.